we started talking about creation. We talked about the first day of creation, and uh, we looked at several things about the first day of creation. And one of the things we were looking at is what exactly did God create on the first day, seeing that the light that he, ha that, uh, he created was a temporary light. And as we got looking, we discovered that uh, without light to distinguish against the dark, he would have no evening and morning, and therefore he was actually, in his essence, making time. And that time is a time for man to be able to operate by. We also looked at the, the fact that if God is the creator of time, it means that he is actually outside of the boundaries of time that we are bound by. And we sort of used uh, the idea of uh, if God was able to operate within the dimensions of time, that he could go forward and backward and therefore time would have a totally different meaning to God than it does to us. Um, but time is also one of the most disputed thing, or the most disputed issue. Be has the world existed? How long has man existed? Everything operates around time because evolution needs long periods of time in order for their theories to work. Creation doesn't. Today, we're going to be looking at day number two. Day number two is um, really quite fascinating when you look at it and actually see what's going on. Before we start, let's bow our heads. Dear Father, I pray that you be with us today, and I pray that you truly help us understand who you are through... I pray that you please give me the words to speak. I pray that this message is a message that we need to hear. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1... And look at Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8. It says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it, be divide, let it divide waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning was the second day. What exactly is a firmament? Well, it's kind of interesting because I looked up firmament in the dictionary. And this is the definition for firmament. It's a noun. The heavens or the sky, especially when regarding a tangible thing. The thunder shakes the firmament. Uh, then it says a celest celestial sphere. Uh, I don't even know what some of these words are. A sphere or a world view is a collection of people. Firmament. I'm here like, I've never heard firmament used in these terms. It's our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is the firmament. Now, what exactly is our atmosphere? How many of you can tell me what our atmosphere is? Hey. What? All right, how many layers is there to our atmosphere? Did, how many of you even knew there was layers to your atmosphere? Hey, um, hey, Brett. Brett, can you put that picture up? 
there's actually five layers to our atmosphere. All right, we have our tropos troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, our thermosphere, and our exosphere. Now, each of these spheres has a different function. Our troposphere is our immediate area that we operate in. It's, it goes from approximately zero to 12 kilometers. And this is where our clouds are. This is where primarily a lot of our, our planes operate out of. Um, this is where uh, we get our oxygen, all right? Our stratosphere goes from 12 to 50 kilometers. It could, contains our ozone layer. It protects us from ultraviolet rays, but it's extremely cold. It's about 60 degrees Celsius, or negative 60 degrees Celsius. Our mesosphere is where meteors are. Um, and that's even colder, that's about a negative 80 degrees Celsius. Well, what's interesting is once we get past those, then we get into the thermosphere. The thermosphere has a high temperature of 1,500 degrees Celsius. So we went from the coldest to 1,500 degrees, a negative 80 degrees Celsius to 1,500 degrees Celsius. And this layer destroys meteors. If a meteor tries entering into our atmosphere, this is primarily what destroys the meteors, is our, uh, our thermosphere. This is also the layer that we see the, the uh, northern lights. So if, how many of you have seen the northern lights? It's pretty, isn't it? How many of you realize how far up in the sky those northern lights were? Those northern lights were somewhere between 80 and 700 kilometers away, or up in, the, up in the, our atmosphere. And then we go into the exosphere. And the exosphere is between 700 and 1,000 kilometers. And uh, that is the outermost layer. This is a very low density, and this is the layer where our satellites are are operating at, and that has a temperature of about 2,000 degrees centigrade. So we have five layers of protection that God gave us, and each one has its own function. You see, the uh, atmosphere is actually made up of gases. There are different, different mixtures of gases and everything, but these gases have particular functions. Um, some of these functions uh, are for oxygen, for us to breathe easier. Other ones are radiation shields. They block harmful UV rays. Some is for temperature regulation. Uh, some is a uh, protective uh, shield from, like what I was saying, like from meteors. And there, there's a number of different things. Did you know that without our atmosphere, birds couldn't fly? You need actual wind currents for, for flying. Without our atmosphere, we would not be able to talk because your sound travels through the air. Without air, there would be no sound. That's why they say that there's no sound in a vacuum. I remember one time my brother learned that in school. He uh, came home from school and... We had chores around the house, and one of the chores my brother had was to uh, vacuum, vacuum the living room. And so we were vacuum, uh, he was vacuuming, I was dusting. And uh, all of a sudden, Randy turned to me, he says, hey, you want to see something cool? Now, when Randy would start a sentence, you want to see something cool, I knew that something very stupid was probably going to happen. 
And so I says, sure. And he goes, and he, my mom had this old Electrolux vacuum, which basically looked like a, a hot dog on wheels with a hose and a vacuum wand that came out of the end of it. My brother went and took the hose off the wand, and he went, watch this, and he had the vacuum on. He turned the wand to his mouth and stuck it up to his mouth, and all of a sudden he went, because he had studied that sound doesn't travel in a vacuum. Well, it traveled in that vacuum, and I, he, it literally sucked all the air out of him. He went, whoo, and he was basically, uh, when he was done, he had a giant hickey on his mouth. But in a true vacuum, uh, the sound doesn't travel because there's no air. You need air. You need an atmosphere for sound to travel. Without our atmosphere, we can't have plant life because it's our atmosphere that helps produce carbon dioxide. Small amounts of carbon dioxide are produced by our atmosphere, which is what the plants use to breathe. God has made an amazing life cycle in the way he's designed our atmosphere. You see, plants breathe in carbon dioxide, and they produce oxygen. They output oxygen. Humans breathe in oxygen and output carbon dioxide. So there's a cycle that happens. And God has it set up for that cycle so that we are continually producing what is needed for other living uh, life on earth to survive. There is possibilities that at one time there was a sixth layer. How many have ever heard of the canopy theory? All right. The canopy theory goes like this. In between the troposphere and the stratosphere, there was a canopy. Now, some say it was a canopy of ice. Some say it was a canopy of vapor. Some say that it was actually sort of a metallic type canopy. That one I find kind of far-fetched. But there is some things about this canopy theory that the Bible seems to indicate to. How many of you realize that the Bible actually seems to indicate this canopy theory? You see, the canopy theory goes like this, that the most common canopy theory is the vapor one, that you have your stroposphere, and in between the stroposphere and stratosphere, pretty close to the ozone layer, there was a vapor canopy that surrounded the Earth. Now, what's cool about this vapor canopy is that it created sort of like a greenhouse effect. If you have a vapor canopy, then that vapor canopy will then actually, it's a secondary, another barrier that protects you from UV uh, rays, ultraviolet rays, which is harmful to us. It also would create a consistent temperature. It's almost like an insulation blanket around there. What's cool about this, though, is because it creates a consistent temperature around the Earth, you wouldn't have extreme weather. Matter of fact, you wouldn't have high winds, you wouldn't have, uh, you know, rainstorms or anything like that. The only rain you would actually have is, would be directly over top of large bodies of water where there's a large amount of evaporation that's going on. On land, you virtually wouldn't have uh, large amounts of uh, rain because there's not as much evaporation going on, but what would end up happening is that you would have a heavy dew. What's also neat about this vapor barrier is that it would increase the, uh, the surface atmospheric pressure, which would basically hyperoxygenate the Earth. 
Now, what would that do? Well, if you hyperoxygenated the earth, one thing is things would grow larger. They have found fossils of dragonflies that are a couple foot, with wingspans of like two foot. You can't, dragonflies won't exist. Matter of fact, uh, one of the big proponent uh, and uh, argue points for this is they say that, uh, I forget which dinosaur is, it's a huge, huge dinosaur. The nostrils are too small. It has the size, of, uh, the nostril size of horses. They hear like it wouldn't have enough oxygen coming in through those nostrils to be able to support uh, the size uh, dinosaur. It would suffocate. Well, it wouldn't if the oxygen levels were increased. So they actually think that that dinosaur might have become extinct because of suffocation. It couldn't uh, maintain enough oxygen levels to continue on. Another thing um, about this was um, it would increase the lifespans. I said, with that type of situation, you, you could have lifespans much longer, even upwards close to 1,000 years. So what happened to this canopy? Let's turn in our Bibles right now and see how the Bible, what the Bible has to say about that. Let's turn to Genesis 2, verses 5 and 6. It says, Every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God did not cause it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. So the Bible indicates that before the flood, there was no rain, but the water was actually, uh, but the uh, plant life was actually watered through a heavy mist or a heavy dew. Does that seem to fit within the parameters of what we were saying if there was a water canopy around the earth? Now, if we look back in Genesis 1, what was it that he did on the second day of creation? He says, And let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, people say, well, the waters from the waters, that means the clouds. Well, yeah, that's what we look at today. But could it originally have meant that there was water down below, and then there was a vapor barrier around there? So what happened to that vapor barrier? Let's go a little further in Genesis to Genesis 6, or Genesis 7. Verses 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep, uh, of the great deep broken up, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. All right. Now they've run calculations, and they said if you took all of the clouds, that all of the the moisture that's in the clouds surrounding the earth, and you took that and brought it down to earth it would create, it would, uh, the water would actually cover the earth one inch. Is that enough to flood the whole earth? No. But you see, what we find is that the water wasn't just coming from the clouds. It says that the waters came from the e deep, and from the sky. You see, when the flood took place, all of the subterranean lakes and rivers underground were opened up. It was seismic activity. The earth was breaking apart, and all the water was coming up from down below, 
But also, if there was a vapor canopy around there, all of the water from up there coming down would be a lot greater volume of water than what we have in the clouds today. You're saying, well, that's all very speculative. Secondly, we don't have, uh, the mountains we have today were not pre-flood mountains. Uh, the, geologically, the Andes, the Rockies, all of those are come from, from uh, continental drifting or sprinting. The ground actually pushing them up. Um, but the volume of water that would need to flood the earth greatly surpass what we would have in our typical clouds. There had to have been a secondary volume of water coming from somewhere. You seem to say, well, that seems kind of speculative. Then you take a look at what life was like after the flood. What we see is we see lifespan start dropping down. It says that God said that he was going to shorten man's life. Well, if they now have that canopy that's been removed that was creating that ideal situations, now they are starting to actually have to have fluctuation of weather, more exposure to UV lights, less oxygenation. Everything would actually affect the lifespan of man. So we see within just a few generations, them living from seven, eight, nine hundred years old down to 150, 200 years old, down to, you know, 150, 100 years old. There was a major change in the, the environment between pre-flood and post-flood. Interesting. But God still left enough of a shelter for us so that we can sustain life. What he did is he removed the shelter from us to make it optimal, to give us paradise, and made it so that we could see the actual repercussions of sin. You see, up until the flood, man was living in paradise in his own way. Uh, I mean, on his own terms. He was living in paradise, but turning his back on God. The repercussions of that sin is now we have to live in a world that has the scars of sin. You say, well, that seems kind of speculative. However, scientists have found that in the Arctic, the Arctic's at one time was a tropical paradise. They have found fossils and stuff of tropical plants, tropical animals, everything in the Arctic. How in the world would those plants be there if at one time that was not a warm climate? See, God, when he made the earth, he made the earth perfect for man. God is not one for, ex for extremes. He designed man to live within a parameter, so it makes sense that he would create an environment that kept within those parameters, where it was comfortable and uh, every aspect of it was a blessing to his creation. How many of you love cold weather? I mean, frigid cold weather. How many of you love extremely hot weather? How many of you just love, love extremely humid weather? Or how many of you like it within like uh, the mid 70s, low 80s with very low humidity? and sunshine, and, and just maybe a cool, gentle breeze. All right. You see, 
God made an earth that he knew would be a blessing. Day two, God was creating his shelter for man. Day one, he cre was creating a time for man. Day two, he was creating a shelter, a protective shelter for man. He was trying to create an environment that would be a blessing to man where they had security and knowing that they were protected. At no time would they have to worry about something hurling out of space and destroying their planet. Even now, people panic about that. I'm not too worried about a giant meteor coming and striking our planet. Because I know that we have a creator that is protecting our planet, and he has developed means to protect our, our planet. So for day two, there is times when God allows things to come into our life that are not so pleasant. Even now, we'll see little meteor, meteorites or something make it to Earth. We know that happens. We've seen the shooting stars. We've seen actual uh, fragments of, of meteorites. Matter of fact, Tutankhamun, King Tut, in his tomb, they actually found a dagger that he was, he was uh, buried with that was made out of a meteorite. They ran analysis on it, and they're like, that's meteorite. And then he had a dagger that was actually made out of a meteorite. We know that there is some stuff that comes to, gets through our atmosphere and makes it to Earth. Is it something we have to panic about? No. And God will allow some things to come through so that we realize that our need for him and his protection. We need to realize that we live in an imperfect world, but how much more is he protecting us from than those little ones that he lets through? I long for the day when we get to heaven and get to actually sit back and let God show us all of the different things that he blocked us from having to encounter. All of the dangers, all of the heartache that God says, nope, uh, I'm drawing the line here. We know God does that because in the book of Job, when God is having his dialogue between God and the devil, and the devil's bragging about how he has control over the earth and he can go to and fro among the earth, and God says, hey, did you notice Job? And the devil, what does the devil say? He's here like, oh, yeah, he worships you because you have a hedge of protection around him and I can't, uh, I can't have access to him. You see, when God created the earth, he put a hedge around our earth of protection. Each and every one of us, if we put our life in his hands, he will put that hedge of protection around us. But it's our choice on whether or not we want to live in that hedge of protection or if we want to do it our own way. It's our choice. A while back, I saw a video of a guy that was out in a hailstorm. I mean, these were like ping pong ball size hail that was coming down, and he had a blanket, and he was trying to cover up his car. He was getting pelted by these, and he's trying to cover up his car to keep it from getting damaged. And I'm here like, that is an idiot right there. And he's sitting there screaming as he's trying to protect his car. I'm like, anybody in their right mind would say, you know what, I got insurance for that. I'm going in where there's shelter. But how many of times do we do the same thing? How many times does God say, you can live within my protection, my shelter, and we say, oh, no, because that's more important to me. And we go and step outside of his protection 
because there's something more important to us than what God is saying, this is where you need to be. And then we complain because we're getting pelted. God is calling us to come into his shelter, come in to his sphere of protection for us. Are we willing to do that? It's his initial plan for us to live in a paradise here on earth. But we've destroyed that. With God, we will find peace, we'll find stability, we will find rest. Without him, we won't find any of that. So it is my, my desire, it is my challenge for each and every one of us to ask ourselves, do we want to live within God's protection? Do we want God's shelter? Are we willing to not care about everything else out there and be focused in on how am I, what do I need to do to live in protection of Christ? Because it's only there that we're safe. And he set up a protection that is impenetrable. Because at the end of the day, the best friend we can have is Jesus Christ. He's the one that will not let us down. Because he's already died for us. He's already paid the price. And he has the protection for us. We just have to accept that and ask ourselves, are we as important, is he as important to us as we are to him. That's my challenge to you. Our closing song today is hymn number 499.